Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we dive deep into DNA recorders, and no, that is not a musical instrument, with very soon to be shiny new PI, Teresa Loveless. This is really great because I knew nothing about sort of DNA recorders before reading your preprint. Uh, I knew they existed and that was about it. So this is going to be a lot, I'm going to learn loads. It's going to be great. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time, especially in between applying for jobs. Um, I can only imagine how stressful that currently is. It's, it's also fun. So <laughs> hopefully your interview the other day went well. I think so. We'll, we'll see. It was one of those. So nowadays they do uh, Zoom screening interviews in general, where you talk for 20 to 30 minutes with the search committee. So it was just one of those. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Fingers crossed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll start with your, the fun fact you supplied, because it's amazing. Um, you have 39 first cousins. That really is a big family. I, I counted mine just before you came in and I have 11 and I thought that was a big family. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. Uh, yeah, my mom has eight sisters. Oh, wow. And <laughs> my dad also has, has three siblings. So yeah, no, it's great because it means, at least in the US, and actually now, uh, to some extent in Europe, I have a cousin everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, when I moved to Orange County for my postdoc, which is, I'm from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So we're about a six hour drive from from there, uh, where we live for my postdoc. But I have a whole family of cousins here. And, you know, COVID has made meeting up more difficult, but but we still get to see, you know, some my my kids and their second cousin get to hang out sometimes. And yeah, no, it's great. And then in grad school in San Francisco, I happened to move onto the same street as my aunt and so we would meet up with multiple cousins there like it was great yeah big benefit especially in science where you know can be quite lonely so having cousins everywhere is great yeah exactly (laughs) no you get you get moved to whatever city and and actually yeah even so I have one job offer and so far and in the city where that is my husband has a first cousin (laughs) who also is about to have a baby so yeah there's just they're everywhere there you go (laughs) (laughs) So, so we're talking about your recent preprint where you looked at DNA record. Well, you created a DNA recorder, but I think it would be sensible for mainly my benefit, but also maybe people listening, if you could explain what a DNA recorder is and does. Absolutely. Okay. So in a broad way of thinking about it, this is a reasonably old field, but it's had a, a huge flowering in the past few years as a result of CRISPR-Cas9 and the general excitement around that new technology. So basically, a DNA recorder is just any technology that you put in a cell that takes a transient event in the life of the cell and turns it into a permanent mutation in that cell's genome. So the simplest way to think about that is something like if you express a specific transcription factor, it's going to be hooked up to some kind of reporter that, for example, will lead to the expression of Cree that then is going to do some recombination in that cell's genome and lead to a permanent mark. So this is why I say, to some extent, this is an old technology, because for a long time, people have been using mouse lines, for example, that mark specific lineages by having an inducible Cree that then will, um, you know, change something like a lock, stop, locks cassette to lead to permanent expression of GFP. So starting in 2016, people have started using CRISPR-Cas9 to lead to uh, sort of a much more diverse set of potential permanent mutations as a result of, of transient events. So there was a really uh, key paper that was joint between uh, Jay Shinduri's lab uh, up at UW and um, Alex Shear's lab, which I think at the time was at Harvard, and they've now moved uh, to Switzerland. But basically, they took zebrafish and put into their genome a cassette of many Cas9 target sites. And just very early in the zebrafish's life, they injected uh, Cas9 with a guide RNA to allow sort of random editing in each cell, leading to sort of a different barcode in each cell where this editing occurred. 
So essentially, there's two ways it can be random, right? So there's multiple target sites. So which target site gets edited is going to be different between cells. And also, once you get a Cas9 cut, then the host DNA repairer comes and, and repairs it. And then you can get different potential editing outcomes. So the actual mutation mate is going to be variable. So essentially what they did is very early in the life of the zebrafish, they basically tagged different cells with a different barcode. And there were actually several versions of this um, that came out as preprints at the same time, as I'm sure multiple people were working on this in parallel. And there's sort of slightly different ways to do it. Uh, something that I think represents a totally different approach or a sort of different family of approaches is one in which uh, a couple groups, so from Tim Liu's group, uh, MIT, and then Reza Calher led it in George Church's group, they made a Cas9 guide RNA that was self-targeting. So essentially the DNA that encoded the guide RNA actually is also the target for the Cas9 guide complex. And so that allows you to get multiple rounds of targeting of the same site. So the idea is that you make the guide, it directs Cas9 actually to its own template, and then when any mutation is made, it can then transcribe a new guide that still exactly matches the target site. So you can come around and get another round of editing. And that leads to um, more potential editing outcomes. And therefore, if you think about starting with one cell that has this synthetic self-targeting guide RNA, at any point when you express Cas9, as that cell is dividing, you can progressively accumulate for, you know, further diversification of that locus so that you can get many potential editing outcomes and sort of tag different cell lineages and distinguish them from each other. And so basically, I can keep going at how this ends up leading to now our approaches in, in sort of sequential editing where you can keep track of the sequential edits. But yeah, there's been a lot of work in the last few years. We're, we're going to get to that bit. <laughs> Okay. Jay's cool. lab seems to be everywhere. I um yeah. During my during my first postdoc, I got started to get into um chromatin remodeling things mm -hmm. like that, and it, it was just everywhere. Like every other paper was Jay's lab. <laughs> it was insane. Yeah, no, they've been they've been really at the forefront of like several different mm. ways in which both genome editing and CRISPR screens, and also um sort of uh, enabling single cell analysis yeah. and, and interpretation. So have you got a nice? concrete example of what you would use a DNA recorder for? I mean, you've kind of touched upon it anyway in that, that first answer. Right. So uh, some really, really good examples um, that I think, especially right now, Jonathan Weissman's lab has been using them for, is any situation where you have big population of cells and you know that a small fraction of them are going to go on and take on a new cell fate of some kind. And you don't know which cells are the ones that are going to seed the new cell fate. So a great example of this that there's been, um, I think, I don't know if the second paper is out yet, but one paper and one recent preprint um, from Jonathan Weissman's lab where they took uh, cells in a primary tumor and then tracked what they were doing as they became metastatic. So at this point, they're mostly using um, the DNA recorder to keep track of cell lineage. So it's essentially making random edits that will allow you to see the relationships between the cells, which tells you basically, if you're looking at uh, metastatic cells, it will tell you how metastatic they are, because you can say like, how many places in the mouse's body do you find all of these closely related cells? And they also tell you, you can find sort of the really informative cells, which are, are clones where one closely related cell became highly metastatic and one did not. Yep. And then you can use single cell RNA sequencing to look at the real key differences between those cells. So hopefully in the future, what we can also do is say, okay, we have some hypotheses about the transcriptional programs that are really essential for driving these fate changes. And we can actually record those as well. But basically any situation where you need the cells themselves to tell tell you which ones are going to acquire the new phenotype. So you can't just like take time points because you don't know which cell in each group is going to be the important ones. But you also want to know what they were doing in the past that made them do that yeah. is sort of the paradigmatic example. I was going to say, can this be used with kind of, I do a lot of differentiations. So mm -hmm. I guess that could be a nice way because we do a lot of single cell with different cells and we see at certain time points like what ha is expressing what but this could actually link it back to an earlier group I guess a group yeah absolutely follow it all the way through it'd be really really handy no exactly like any situation where some of the cells but not all of them will undergo this this the fate switch and especially where you can't take time points because for example the process isn't synchronous or um you know it's happening in a an accessible location like inside an organism or 3 a.m in the morning i've done a lot of that it would be even better <laughs> yeah exactly 
<laughs> it's like, is it accessible to me because I'm asleep <laughs> in my bed? We, we need to start getting people on who do like microscopy techniques because every, every, every time you have somebody on, Emma seems to pick up a cool new technique she wants to use. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and also in terms of like, from my perspective, I'm always trying to find applications where we can get stuff, like get a new technology quickly mm. into a biological question. So anything that's that's ex vivo is like, Awesome. Um, although I think we're we're using tumor xenografts is also something where you can very pretty quickly like mm. put the new technology in the cell and then put the cell in the animal in this case. Yeah. So in your preprint, you you've got a list in the introduction about all the things that a good DNA recorder should be, and then you want to state that the existing recorders can't do them all. What was the limitation that meant they couldn't do them all? Yes. So um, basically, the the idea of continuous operation and being able to record events in order were challenging because previous recorders either can only do at each location or each target site can only do a single operation, right? So in the sort of traditional, you know, as of 2016 DNA recorder where you have a single or a, a series of DNA target sites that Cas9 can target, essentially once it makes an edit, then that site now cannot be changed in the future because the, the guide RNA doesn't match anymore. Uh, so that's, that's one way it can be limited. Conversely, we had these self-targeting guide RNAs that can come around and do multiple rounds of Cas9 editing. But because in general, Cas9 makes uh, deletion mutations, if you do one edit, and then the, the boundaries of that deletion mutation are sort of the new information or, or sort of mark that edit. If you come around to do another one, those previous boundaries will get deleted. And now you'll have a new edit. Yeah. And so essentially, like, you can't accumulate information at one site, yeah. which, is, which was the, the real limitation. And so we'd previously published... Well, we pre-printed it in 2019, and it was published in 2021, um, in part because we got our reviews back like March 10th, 2020. <laughs> so <laughs> we couldn't do the experiments yeah. to uh, respond to them as quickly as we would have liked. But um, so so basically, like we modified self-targeting guide RNAs to make insertion mutations, which then does allow you to accumulate edits at the same site. But just due to how guide RNAs are, what happens is you can do a few rounds of editing, um, and, you know, accumulate mutations in a few rounds, but eventually you get a long guide RNA, which like drastically reduces its efficiency because Cas9 doesn't like long guides. And we still have the same problem where you, you have a lower chance, but still a chance in each round that you'll get a deletion mutation. And because that's sort of a terminal state, uh, eventually everything falls into the, the well of deletions. And after a few rounds, you have no loci left. Yeah. So uh, basically what we needed was a way to edit a single site so that you can get ordered accumulation of edits, but not delete the previous information and also don't reduce the efficiency in each yeah. round. And before you answer the next question, which I think you might be about to do, how did you do that? So essentially what we needed, and um, I should say now, which I'm, I'm sure this will come up, but like uh, Jason Dury's lab also had the same realization that we did <laughs> at the exact same time, which is that we needed a way to make a variety, like a wide variety of edits that could be made into a, um, a continuously editing system that didn't make double strand breaks because there, that was sort of the, the dichotomy in the past where essentially you, you can make an edit that has many possible resolutions, right? But what you're doing is making a double strand break. And that always leads to the possibility that you'll get a deletion mutation that destroys your continuous editing. Yeah. Conversely, there were ways to um, make edits without double strand breaks, like with a base editor, but those had a smaller number of potential outcomes. And therefore it was harder to make them sort of accumulate extremely varied information in a progressive way. So when Prime Editor was introduced by David Liu's lab in uh, the end of 2019, it was clear to us that this was a, a opportunity to kind of abolish this trade-off. So essentially, um, most of the original Prime Editor paper, they actually did use NICs on both strands that lead to a, a rate of deletion mutations that did not prevent them from doing extremely uh, great editing, but was too high for doing many, many, many rounds like we wanted to. But even if you just don't make the second NIC, so essentially just make a single NIC, no double strand breaks, no any breaks on the other strand, you can get many, many, many different editing outcomes at an acceptably high efficiency. So yeah, basically 
I had heard a rumor that David Lou's lab had like something cool, uh, but like no other information other than that, um, which I guess is like always the case. But yeah. um, but basically I had, so we'd been trying to figure out a way to sort of combine base editing and Cas9 cutting with TDT to try to like construct some kind of system that could have these properties. Um, but when Prime Editor came out, it was like, oh yeah, that's the way to do it. It was, it was very clear. So yeah, basically that's the enabling technology. And then we played around with a, several different architectures to find one that allows you to do, you know, progressive rounds of editing uh, without making double strand breaks. So, so you mentioned double strand breaks are one of the ways that this can kind of cause a termination. How do you naturally stop this? Is this just when you take the cells to then use them for whatever you're going to do downstream? Or can you encode a stop at a certain time point, for example? Oh, you mean how do you stop editing? Yeah, stop the well, yeah, stop the recording aspect. Yeah. So um currently we haven't implemented any way of, of stopping, um, but there are ways that you could do it. So for example, if you wanted to stop editing, I think the way that I would do it is to just get rid of Cas9. Hmm. Um, so essentially you're you're expressing in our case prime editor, which is a, a Cas9 fusion protein. And if if I wanted to say at time X, stop editing, but don't kill the cells, I think what I would do is just encode Cas9 in a way that could be excised by Cree. Yeah. And just get rid of it because essentially what when you express cas9 in a cell it's going around and finding every single pam which you know in the case of what we're using uh, streptococcus pyogenes cas9 the kind of standard one is ngg right so very frequently in the genome and kind of starting to unwind it and checking if it matches the guide rna so i you know i wouldn't want that in my cells mm. if i didn't need it to be there yeah. you can do an inducible system i guess as well and just yeah, exactly. And then turn it off. Then just hit, just stop adding docs or whatever system you're using. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we have made a version of our of our earlier system that has a similar setup where you just have to add um, this uh, chemical that activates the hypoxia response pathway and ha has the same result where you can like pretty pretty firmly turn it off. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I may have missed this, but like, so it's in a specific site that I'm guessing is like a safe harbor somewhere in the genome so that it's not causing just kind of random mutations all over that may be affecting the cell. Yes. So basically we target editing to um, a single site in the genome. Yeah. And the way that our system works, we actually can edit in theory, any genomic site. We don't actually need a synthetic locus of any kind. So the idea is to target it to somewhere that is accessible to Cas9. So some regions that are like heavily heterochromatinized, for example, are less accessible. And so that would presumably reduce your um, efficiency. And then of course, yeah, absolutely. You need to find a place that's not going to harm the <laughs> cell. And what we've done so far is just there's a, a site that we know is very accessible to editing and doesn't seem to have any phenotypic consequences. So we've just been using that, you know, also because we already had primers that worked well, you know, like yeah. there's, there's historical reasons, but I think <laughs> in the future, I want to take advantage of the way in which our system can be used at any endogenous locus and try to take advantage of the highly repetitive nature of mammalian genomes to have, you know, more than one recording site in each cell uh, that can be targeted by the same recording machinery. So is there a resolution limit to what you can record? So, you know, do, does, do the events that you're recording have to be a certain time apart? I mean, obviously, I would suggest they can't be maybe at the same time is my takeaway. Yes. So basically, if we're just thinking about a single recording site in each cell, hmm. there are several limits to your resolution. So I should say, first of all, we have not yet actually recorded events per se in order. We've recorded different peg RNAs, which are just prime editor guide RNAs. We've encoded like different transfection orders that we've done sort of as an artificial proof of concept. Mm. We actually are, I'm doing the transfection on Friday to <laughs> put in, you know, different inducible peg RNAs so we can record actual events. And the limitations on resolution are several. So the first is sort of the baseline efficiency of prime editor with these particular sequences. So I say we're only getting about an average of seven-ish percent of our loci to um, make an edit each day. So essentially, you know, on average, each edit takes more than a week, <laughs> like more like two weeks. And so in that particular cell, that's a real limit on your yeah. resolution. Although, you know, in some proportion of cells, you'll have more efficiency and therefore you know, you can record uh, more fine-grained events. However, that's something that can be improved. You know, we, we've only 
begun to really optimize that. But there's a there's also an intrinsic limitation to the the temporal resolution, which is that it seems to be the case that after Cas9 is recruited to a, a target site, it actually its half life on the the DNA is pretty long. So presumably you can't get another edit uh, any faster than the time it takes for Cas9 to go there, sit there, and then the um, reverse transcriptase component of Prime Editor needs to, uh, you know, make the new template. And then there's some kind of flap resolution, you know, where the edited template you know, competes with the original DNA to eventually incorporate the mutation. And then there's presumably some processing that needs to be done by the host repair machinery. And then I think another kind of intrinsic limit to temporal resolution is that very likely, you know, so cells are evolved to like not make changes to their DNA and you know to resolve DNA damage essentially to limit mutations. So it's quite likely that Prime Editor and Cas9, you know, any kind of editing like goes there and the majority of the time it's prepared without mutation. And so then it has to come back and try again. So I think that's really the intrinsic limitation. And the way that we want to get around that in the long run is to have multiple recording sites so that you know, even if a particular recording site doesn't pick up on an event that's only several hours long, for example, yeah. one of them will. And, you know, you can get more of the picture by by kind of averaging those sites. However, obviously, you can only have ordered recording if you have, you know, for events that are at a single site. And so, you know, that's a trade-off that you need to mm. optimize. But the good thing is probably even if you have multiple sites in the same cell, it's, it's likely that the expression of Cas9 is such and the rate limiting steps of Cas9 editing are such that they're not going to compete with each other. Yeah. So yeah, actually, we're in the process of, of testing that directly now, just because I feel like it's something we should establish sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and actually, a, an undergrad in the lab is is that's her project, so it's just it is fun. So do you do you find any off-target effect with this? Are you getting anything that is past being recorded that shouldn't be? Yes. So that's that's another um, I think real advantage of of having prime editor that only is making a nick instead of a double strand break. Mm. So what we did is uh this is in i think yeah this is figure 3c of our preprint so what we did is we took every single sequencing read of our recording locus and then bend it into the closest number of rounds of editing right so anything that was a deletion or sorry each edit makes a 20 nucleotide insertion so anything that was a deletion or up to nine nucleotides got binned into zero rounds anything that was between 10 a 10 nucleotide insertion and a 29 nucleotide insertion got binned into one round etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we just said is it the exact number of nucleotides that we expect um suggesting that it is the, the intended edit, or is it a different number? And basically what we found is that at each size, 99% of the reads were the exact length that we expect and 1% were uh, something different. Hmm. And so essentially the, the number of unintended edits seems to be quite low. Uh, although there's, there's obviously another kind of off target that we need to assess, which is just elsewhere in the genome, are we getting, uh, you know, random mutations? And actually something that came up because we pre-printed this uh, is that we are probably, and this is this is something that I should have realized much earlier, but that, you know, now we know and we have a way to fix it. But essentially, like we are getting off targets at the loci that encode our peg RNAs because, but they're not really off targets. They contain the exact sequence that we're targeting. Um, so this is something that that very few people realize. And like essentially, someone who uh, is a potential collaborator who knows a ton about prime editing very kindly pointed this out to me. And so essentially, now we have a way to protect the peg RNA loci um, by essentially making nicks on the same strand, which just kills prime editing. So we've we'll defeat that off target, although that's something that it's one of those things that like you you get stuck in a way of thinking about something and so you don't see it. But basically one person saw it. <laughs> so grateful that we put it out there because without having something like putting the whole story out there, I don't think there was enough information for other people to mm. notice. But so that's that's kind of solved. And in the long run, we'll just put introns in the mm. peg RNAs. But um, once I have a system that I want to make into a mouse, for example, yeah. I'll do all the well-established protocols to make sure that <laughs> the particular sequences I choose aren't like going off elsewhere in the genome and causing trouble. Yeah, you've, you've just segued brilliantly into the section about preprints there. You're making my job very easy oh, today. Okay, I hope I I'm love, not. I love that. <laughs> it's, I love that when that happens. Some people make it really difficult. <laughs> So, so you, you've touched on the, the benefit of having, you know, other people being able to look at your work. Yeah. So have you had any other experiences with preprinting so far? Is this the first paper you've preprinted? So it's not. And actually, I had a great experience the last time, too. I touched on it a little bit, but we made a previous editor that 
made ordered continuous insertion mutations, but other than that has basically nothing in common. It's a totally different architecture. And what we used previously used a self-targeting guide RNA, and then we expressed Cas9 as all self-targeting guides do, but then also TDT, which is a DNA polymerase that instead of using a template, just binds to double strand break ends and adds random nucleotides. So the result of that was instead of getting rounds of deletion mutations, we got rounds of insertion mutations that actually do accumulate in order. So that basically we got the key result in that work near the end of 2017, early 2018. And then, you know, there's a lot of follow-up and demonstrations that we wanted to do. And essentially, we spent a, about a year really trying to figure out how to ha have large populations of cells and then split them in a known pattern and then try to reconstruct the pattern from sequencing the recording locus, which actually ends up being much more technically challenging than you would think. Because essentially, you have, you know, if you have two populations of cells that are related to each other, you have to capture a pretty large proportion of both populations in order to get the ones that are related to each other. Yeah. So um, that's technically like actually difficult. And so we finally, you know, I learned a lot about Amplicon sequencing. And, and so basically, we were ready to publish that. I mean, we were ready to have a reasonably final version of that in about April 2019. Um, and I will say, uh, my daughter was born in August of 2018. So <laughs> that probably didn't, you know, help my efficiency, but it's totally worth it. It would be good. It's good you said that because if you said it wasn't worth it, oh. in about 18 years time, you would have regretted that. Oh, yeah, no, she'll she'll search. And <laughs> no, I'm always expecting her to run in here. But um, <laughs> the I also have a six year old son who I also is, is wonderful. <laughs> just for future reference. But um, so we were ready in, in May 2019. We got everything together and put it up. And then we had some things we wanted to kind of improve, but we really wanted it to be out there. I also made sure everything was available on Adgene at that time. And we actually had people requesting it right away because I'd been talking about it for a while. So I feel like, you know, people who are interested yeah. kind of knew about it. And I just wanted everything to be available, right? Like you want people to be able to use your work and- You were the cool rumor for a while. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But you want to be like a known thing, um, yeah. especially if you're not able to, you know, if it doesn't immediately go into a journal. So essentially, we spent a really long time submitting it one place and then hearing back and et cetera. So yeah, I mean, it was like there was it was great to have it preprinted. And essentially, by the time we got it at its like perfect home, uh, Nature Chem Bio, like one of our reviews was even like, this has been on bioarchives since May 2019 and like people are using it and mm. it's great you know like so yeah it was it was perfect and especially because of covid right because essentially yeah. we got reviews back in March of 2020 which under normal circumstances would only have taken a couple of months to respond to <laughs> but then between not being able to go into lab for several months and then all of these like you know we had shifts and we also you know everyone obviously has experienced this we also had like supply chain issues where we couldn't get necessary components. Like yeah. we wanted to do a nucleofection and the shipping of the samples from Germany took, you know, a month instead of a week, you know, like all this kind of. So it was really nice that it was out there and, you know, people could use it or, you know, look at it and come up with something of their own or whatever. And so when it finally came out in, in March of 2021, it was much improved by the review process. Mm. But, you know, the essential thing had been out there. If people like really, you know, were right in the field, they sort of knew about it already. I, 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 I think that's one of the biggest benefits of them is that you can, you know, people can use it straight away, which is great. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, preprinting was, in the case of this paper, you know, essentially, uh, Jason Dury's lab has two back-to-back -back papers that have, mm. I think, fundamentally a different architecture. And I think we're going to end up being useful, being the right choice for different applications. Yeah. But it was very important that when they deposited their preprint, uh, <laughs> we could deposit it an hour after yeah. they did, <laughs> uh, or after they after theirs came out. And, you know, kind of just, you know, like, obviously, we independently came up with this yeah. general approach. And it's nice that we're both out there. Uh, and also, obviously, for applying for jobs, it's been really nice to have a preprint that I can point to in both cases. And, you know, although, although it wasn't actually out when I submitted most of my applications, now that it is out, I feel like when I go on interviews and stuff people who are in the field have already looked at it and it's really helpful to kind of get everything out there and, and you've done you've done what to us feels like a long phd but it's just an american phd it's it's a 
a long American PhD too. Uh, um, <laughs> so that was seven years? So yes. So basically it was really six and a half. So I submitted, I resubmitted my second paper. Okay. So first of all, so obviously, you know, with American PhDs, you spend the first year rotating. Mm -hmm. And then what I ended up doing was fairly early on, I had an interesting result. And I like, I came up with a whole thesis proposal that involved saying, wow, we can get activation of the DNA replication checkpoint without either of the two known activators of the sensor kinase. And it was like, this is interesting. We're going to do a screen for the other activator. And like, and then I think the real answer is that the other activator is just the replication fork. So essentially, like there wasn't, like we were potentially doing a screen that would have shown just that it's not necessary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and there's there's more stuff to work out there that I think people have done subsequently, but it wasn't like, we did, that wasn't the thing that we had the tools to find. Mm. So we published a paper just showing our results, but then I was kind of like three years into a PhD and kind of like either done or needed to start something totally different. So, so then I started a new thing, which was actually in human cells, which our lab had previously never worked with. So there was a lot of like, I need to like figure out how to get a tissue culture hood <laughs> and like <laughs> um so there's a really kind person who was retiring who eventually let me like sort of inherit <laughs> his tissue culture space but like I finished that project and sort of resubmitted the paper and then had a baby six weeks later so my son totally worth it for so that, that's two PhDs and a baby <laughs> it's amazing now well I mean you know, they both really, I mean, I think they were both really important and in, in learning different things from them. Um, and then I came back to wrap some stuff up. I like, I took a leave of absence for like five months as like a maternity leave. And then I came back to wrap some stuff up, but I was basically done after six and a half years. But it was really nice to come back in a place where I knew things, where I could get used yeah. to being like, <laughs> yeah. go to drop off at the daycare and like, you know, juggle all this stuff and then also be applying for postdocs. And so yeah, then I've done a really long postdoc as well. But honestly, like just, this has been so good. Like I've learned so much at each step of my PhD and postdoc. And I just wish, I just think it's a real barrier because frequently they're so poorly paid. Yeah. And I just like, I wish there was a way to kind of, you know, like in most fields, you don't become the like head boss of everything as your second job, right? Like, mm. but like you get paid, you know, in a way that can allow you to pay off student loans if necessary, or like have a family or whatever, you know, support other people you care for. Like, it just, I don't know. There's a, uh, there's a new postdoc started at work this week, actually. And she's, she's from America. And she was talking today about her student loans. And it was, just, it was horrible. It was, they're so big. Yeah. There's so much money that you have to pay back. And the whole system just seems terribly designed, especially if you go into science and don't earn enough to really pay it back. Well, it's a real, and I, I should say, like, I've been really fortunate to not need student loans. And it's just like a total game changer, right? To allow me to do this really long postdoc. And it's just another way that you reinforce inequality based mm. on, you know, the income you had growing up. And it's, yeah, it's just ridiculous. And I don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, I know in some countries in Europe, there's like sort of professor positions that you're still sort of working with someone in a like larger lab setup that seem potentially interesting. So we've got um, some of the fellowships we can apply for. They're a bit like a semi-independent postdoc. So okay. you, it's, it's, it's your work. It, it, you know, it's your project, you've got your own money, but you do it under the guidance of somebody who's more experienced. So you kind of, it's a lab within a lab situation, really. Right. It depends where you do it. Some places will treat you like a postdoc, some places will treat you more like a PI. Right. So sometimes you can get students, sometimes you can't. Uh, very helpful. Um, but yeah, we have those, which are, I think they're really good, but they're also, the main one in the UK, the funder changed how they're funding recently. Um, and they, basically, they shook it all up so that They've kind of gotten rid of that and they've replaced it with one that now has a, you can only apply three within three years post PhD, which is, I mean, it rules out so many people. Um, right. And then they're never going to fund me anyway because I keep complaining about them. Um, so I, I mean, keep doing it. I feel like that shouldn't be it a shouldn't, factor, but, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, so we, we've got them, but they're not, there's not many of them in the UK, which is a shame because I think they would be really good. But most of, it, most of it is similar to everywhere else where it's either you go lectureship route or the PI fellowship route. Right. Which are both pretty good in the UK, actually, if you can get them. Yeah, no, it's, I, don't, I just, I just feel like we're, we're sort of in the US, at least just the way that it's set up, it's almost like requiring a sort of gentleman scientist, like mm. 
aspect where you're sort of like i don't i don't know it, it just seems really unequal I, th- I think that's the case i think this is science is horribly unequal still which is a huge shame uh, ah. i mean it, it's I, actually you, i think you're the first person we've had on since all this has come out on twitter but what do you think about the recent shift we've seen from a, a lot certainly in the u.s a lot of professors leaving their jobs to go and work at the new sort of startups that are oh just popped yeah up like recently. altos and <laughs> yes I, I mean what, what are your thoughts on that i mean i'm just i don't know enough i i think about what it's like to be a pi in the u.s um i think i'll find out soon i i have heard the quote that like you know you spend a year writing an nih grant and probably resubmitting it and all this stuff and they give you you know 1.5 million dollars yep and you can spend like 15 minutes with a vc and they'll give you like 15 million dollars <laughs> so i think there's probably I, I don't know to what extent it's just that if you have plans that require a lot of money Hmm. there's not really a different way to do it than to tap into this private setup or if it's something sort of more pernicious where you feel like i know there was a quote from um cma chow who's starting arcadia on twitter where she was saying during the pandemic especially she felt like she couldn't do right by her students and postdocs in academia Hmm. the way that she could in private industry so that's something that seems like a deeper potential problem where the sort of large bureaucracy of academia doesn't allow you to do things that are clearly right and required yeah and that i don't know to what extent that that's general and whether you know that's sort of a necessarily better in industry all the way but certainly something like pay disparities right like seems or the way in which having like a long poorly paid trainee period (laughs) yes is intrinsically unequal is um yeah is like something that can be fixed by hey yeah. by having things be privately funded and yeah. i don't know i think i think being a trainee when you're in your 30s and you're also considered a world expert is just insulting it's it's one i th- i hate it <laughs> it's just so it's such a backwards way of thinking like i never thought of myself as a trainee as a postdoc until kind of johnny had kind of said yeah we're still training because i guess we're kind of training towards a pi ship but then i'm also not convinced that the the way in which i like being at the bench and like yeah. i'm not sure if being a pi is the next step for me so like it's like it feels like it's kind of veering off a different path (laughs) rather than I'm getting trained what I'm getting trained for if I'm a trainee I guess (laughs) and I still don't think we really get trained for that anyway no I don't think we do not 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 particularly well yeah well yeah I mean it's (laughs) often it comes down to whether or not you're working with a pi who's nice enough to support you enough to do it and not yeah. everyone is lucky enough to do that, unfortunately. Which seems like another aspect of academia that's potentially really <laughs> flawed, where like there's this, both there's a lot of variation in your experience based on who you end up working for, but also they have so much power over you. Yeah. And, you know, th- I mean, this is why I think I've had such a good experience in my postdoc is that I really, like, I got extremely lucky to work with someone who's like very, very serious about making sure that you get exactly the training you need to achieve your goals. And that was a lot of luck. And also that that I really prioritized searching for, for that as when I was looking for a postdoc. But so frequently that isn't what you're getting trained for, right? You're getting trained to like be really productive at the bench, which is awesome. But also then it's confusing why you're not just a person working <laughs> at the thing that you're an expert at rather than- And trainer. getting paid more to do it, like yeah. the other industry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah we, um, cause we're, we've got, there's some strike action going on in the UK soon. Yeah, here too. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Like the, I don't, the University of California students just like successfully unionized. Yes. The, um, I became disabled from essentially like I messed up my hands by doing too much pipetting as a grad student which you know like that's the thing that happens that's totally fine out I the issue was because I wasn't an employee no one knew what to do with me in terms of just getting basic accommodations so I could keep working yeah. and having someone having like a place who could advocate for you is why we we need a union yeah also you know there's things within the uc that they they know about but that they need to really fix like their uh i don't know if this ever happens in the uk but their payroll software frequently just doesn't pay students for months uh, we sometimes we sometimes have issues with phd students getting paid on time yeah I- i've seen that come up a few times and it's like people need to pay the rent <laughs> like mm. this is not so having someone to, you know, you need someone to advocate for you if you can't trust your institution to necessarily, you know, pay you, for example. Um, and frequently, I mean, that's another example of where you just need a good PI because frequently the way that that, the only way that that can work, right, is your PI will literally pay your rent for you. Yeah. Which like, what? <laughs> 
we um so there's a, there's a pi at sheffield um who he would occasionally have students stay like phd students who are at the end of their time mm-hmm. stay with him because obviously they'd run out of money oh my gosh and it, it like if so it's particularly you know students who are foreign for example and they right. don't, maybe they don't have any family in the country yeah um so he like they would have to stay with him just to get through to the end because they'd run out of money and it was wow. a ridiculous way of doing things very nice that he would do that but right yeah way of doing it. it's just it's you shouldn't be required to think about these things right i mean no. it's it's the, i mean it's your responsibility i think as a pi but also we should just have a system that pays people salaries and make sure they're you know in the u.s obviously health insurance yeah. And continuity of health insurance is a huge deal that is often also messed up, you know, either by the sort of intrinsic, like shifting nature of trainee contracts or by, you know, just badly working <laughs> software mm-hmm. in the case of UC. But, you know, I spent so many hours on the phone with various people because I changed titles and therefore didn't have health insurance on paper for like a month and a half. <laughs> and it was just like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just like a, a very that's a very U.S. story, but um, <laughs> it's alright. It makes us feel slightly better about ourselves for a bit. Yeah, it's, it's des- desperately needed in this country at the moment. We'll, t- we'll take anything we can get. Well, if it if it helps at all, I have needed a migraine medication for four months, and I it's coming today, I think. But the company that is whose job is to keep costs down and therefore has been like negotiating with me about whether I can have this medication and is also the company that is the pharmacy that supplies it. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine you had a company and you got paid for not doing your job. <laughs> like, yeah. It's... It has been fun. <laughs> Yeah, the whole US system is just crazy. <laughs> yeah, as Brits, we look over at the US healthcare and we're just like, oh my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's, I think, I don't know, if I ever have any spare time, I want to just be like a volunteer, like fighter with insurance companies for people. Cause like, I don't know, I just feel like I have all this like very pointless expertise. And it's like, I don't even know how you do it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, I've been fortunate to have like a little bit of spare time and like some familiarity w- with these like ridiculous contracts and stuff, you know, where you have to call them up and be like, excuse me, can you tell me in the plan documents where it says that I owe this fee? Because it clearly says that I don't. But like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people don't have time to do that or like, mm. you know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know if you, have, if you have other questions. I feel like we got, <laughs> we kind of veered off, haven't we? <laughs> we totally <laughs> veered off. Um, that, I, I had, I, that was all my questions anyway. Okay, cool. I enjoyed our discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Who, do, who doesn't, who doesn't like talking about the ridiculousness of the American healthcare system? Yeah, no. <laughs> Mind boggling. Uh, no, but, oh my God, I'm so happy. I hope, really hope my medicine shows up because <laughs> I've had a migraine more days than not for like three months oh god it's okay it's like there I can usually work through them but it's and it's just the stress it's totally just the stress of like mm. being on the job market and then having to like write this paper and get it out because we had this competition and like all this stuff but oh my gosh I'm so happy I hope it works but <laughs> yeah I mean I don't and also I don't know I mean I think to some extent the fact that it stuff is so expensive here does to some extent subsidize the R&D but then it's just a question of like y- yeah like is it really I don't know like it's also <laughs> like we hope maybe that's what's happening but we don't know for sure yeah. right it's like i'll be yeah. much happier about it if that's the case but yeah. <laughs> with your interview i hope it went well it went well and i hope it's positive and fingers crossed for you and everything yeah thank you so i already have one offer so i'm gonna be oh. a pi <laughs> yay <For sure. laughs> but the question is just like you know where and all this stuff. where's the favorite where's the favorite cousin living that's that's the question, that's the question. Right? i don't even i mean <laughs> I, don't, I can't say who my favorite cousin is, on, <laughs> but here is a really good place for cousins. If if they all listen on the same day, we might just break the top 20 in the US. So, <laughs> you know, that'd be great help. <laughs> I should really get them on that. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much for your time. I, I enjoy this chat. Yes, thank, thank you so much. But yeah, and good luck with um your postdocs and obviously you're doing a lot more outreach than than i am but um, <laughs> we, we try maybe it, it digs into my lab time a little bit sometimes but it's worth it i think <laughs> it's part of the job right of science yeah. broadly yeah and i hope i didn't say anything that wasn't true but i don't think i did 
<laughs> so I, I've definitely done that before, so it's fine. Cool. Yeah. I always just worry <laughs> that I will like miss someone else's contributions and like not properly credit them. Oh, it's okay. Oh, when I got it wrong, it was my own work. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that it was on, it was on the radio. It was on the radio. I got completely the wrong number. And I had a tweet after them afterwards to say, I'm really sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Highly embarrassing. Well, I mean, that's the right way to do it, though. Like, they're wrong no. so much. <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally awesome. Thank you so much. Right, thank thank you. you so much. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. Where do I find out about the different bioarchive licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Ugh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows.